I was always making excuses mm-hmm. as to why I couldn't do this and why I wasn't like that. And I guess it's just a bit of a bit of a maverick. I quit my job, and just committed to it for three months, and then the Wellington team and did my goals too low. Mm. Didn't realise, you know, my goal was to be an All Black. Yeah. Nothing wrong with that, is there? My goal should have been to be a great All Black. You know. Yeah. The difference, you know, you behave a certain way, you start doing things the way a great all black does. I was just, I was happy to get there. And once I got this, there was one thing that you said what's been the most life changing thing was. Oh, what a lad. Well, when you talk about some of the biggest lads in the game here in New Zealand, today's guest is up there with one of the all time greats. Now, to list the teams that he's been involved in is half a novel, but I can highlight his playing career by saying he's a four-time Super Rugby winner, three times with the Crusaders, one time with the Chiefs. He's played four times for his country, the All Blacks. He's even won a top 14 with Racing Metro. Coaching-wise, he's coached Waikato to an MPC title, assistant coach for the Chiefs for, to make two finals, and he's even coached the mighty Red Sparks into relegation. He's such a champion man with a hell of a story. It is the great... Ross Filippo, welcome, mate. <laughs> <laughs> Hell of an intro, yeah. I like the relegator call, though. It's nice. <laughs> well, I was a big part of that, yeah, so yeah, no, no. <laughs> yeah, you can quickly offload that to me. Oh, it's that's probably what happens. Yeah, that's what happens. <laughs> the uh, worst no, signing I'll, in Red I'll, Sparks history. I'll own that. <laughs> <laughs> oh, but it's great to get you on. You've been on my wish list for a long time. I know you're... You've got a hell of a story, and you're a champion man. A lot of people around the country respect you so highly, so it's good to get you in the hot seat and go through your journey. Oh, no, it's, honestly, it's a real privilege to be here. Um, it's been awesome actually see you like, start this up, and then it's kind of created momentum. It's got bigger and bigger and bigger, and obviously some of the guests you've had on here have been, um, you know, well esteemed people. And um, yeah, it's actually a privilege to be invited to come on so yeah well yeah, none bigger than you and oh. um, I did want to start well I, I I love the clip of um, Mark Stafford he, he told me the story a few times but just around when he was struggling and I think it sums you up as a as a person and um, just a genuine human being who who's always there for his mates and I've got the clip here because some people might not know um, what I am talking about but there's this clip of Staffy it was quite dark and I don't know what made me do it but I went and sat on the back step and I rang a very, very good friend of mine, Ross Filippo. I didn't know what to say. And he goes, hey bro, you all good? No. I'm okay. And I just sat there and we were silent. And every minute he would just go, I'm here bro. And he was saying, happy to do this for as long as you want. I'm happy for you to talk if you want. I'm just here. And I reckon 20 to 30 minutes I sat there and he'd just go, I'm here bro. And that's all I needed was just someone to share my nothingness oh, powerful gives me goosebumps even listening to it with you yeah well, I to be honest yeah it's it actually it does stir a lot of emotions mm. but I think at the time I'd you know I was just doing what I f- felt um, staff needed um, you know it's what you do for your friends yeah um it was during the COVID and he was kind of locked down and stuck in Auckland by himself and yeah, he just just gave me a phone call and you know, I remember just sitting there and we just sat there for ages. Um, but I didn't realise it, at the time I didn't realise it had such a a big impact on him. Mm. Yeah, I was just, I was just being me and then, um, you know, I could tell that he was in a hole and you're sitting there going with all these stupid regulations around travel and stuff like that, which... Um, yeah, I mean, you, you wanted to invite him down and come and spend some time and come stay here. Yeah. But, um, yeah, it was just, it was the best thing I could do, mm. you know, or offer him outside of breaking the law at the time. <laughs> 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 well, what I like about it is that um, you haven't, all you've really given is your time and just your support. Like, I always feel like when I'm in those situations, I want to, I try and give answers and that yeah. is not what they want like that was probably the big learning that I got from um, that was you just you're just sitting with them and um, you don't actually have to answer anything you just the support is what they need or is what they're after in those moments where people are struggling yeah I, I guess I, I learned uh, early on 
particularly with my my friend group growing up, um, that just quite often if one of us were kind of battling with something, mm. you were, I don't know why or how it kind of naturally manifested, but we just give each other space, yeah, unload our shit, um, and so it's been just. I guess if someone comes to me with a problem or something, I'll first I'll always try and see if I can flesh it out and give them space to actually put mm. the whole problem on the table as opposed to me going, well, oh, yeah, there's a solution here and there's a solution <laughs> there and don't worry, there's another one here. And, but I'm pretty sure if my wife sees this, she'll be, <laughs> she'll be like, you offer me solutions every time I talk to you. Um, but, yeah, I, I guess, and that's... That that, I guess that interaction with staff, um, when I saw that in that format, mm. um, and then realizing the impact that it actually had on him personally, it was actually it blew me away. Because mm. um, you know it was quite, yeah, it was, it was cool to know that I was able to be there for him in an extreme time of need, mm. you know, and and didn't have to do anything special. Just just by being there was. Um, helped them kind of get through that, that period. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, you know, it was, yeah, I don't know. It was just, I guess I was just being myself. That's yeah. you. Yeah. And that's yeah. what I love about it. And that's why I'm looking forward to going through your journey because um, you are just that sort of guy, that genuine guy who cares for his mates and will do anything for his mates. So um, we'll, we'll start at the start, though. Um, yeah. Lower Hutt, wasn't it? We, is that where you grew up? Lower Hutt, mate. Yeah. What was that like for you? Um, I didn't know any different. You know, yeah, it was it was where I grew up. Um, dad, my dad uh, immigrated from Samoa when um, you know before I was born, <laughs> 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 and then um, met my mum, and um, yeah, I guess I started a family, and I grew up in on the same street, lived in two houses on the same street. Oh yeah, yeah. So we started in. Um, in a little kind of flat on one of the road, and I don't really remember it, but um, I was young, and then they bought a house just down the road on the opposite side of the street, and moved down there. <laughs> it's kind of where my main memories from early life kind of yeah. reside. And um, did you have siblings? Yeah, I got an older brother and oh, yeah. um, and a sister, and younger sister, and yeah, just kind of. Started there, went to uh, primary school, Gracefield School, little school, uh, nothing, nothing major, but it was you know it was probably about a k and a half from home, and it was those days when once you started school at five, you walked to school by yourself. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, and yeah, you get lost along the way here and there, but um, it was kind of like yeah, growing up a lot. It was yeah, that was good. What were you like as a kid? Tusu. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> my brother was a sensible one. Oh yeah, yeah. I always seem to um, find myself uh, hanging out with the wrong people. Yeah, um, or, or or just making poor decisions. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I guess my my brother <laughs> my brother was probably the example of um, what my parents were hoping I would <laughs> be like, and, and obviously my sister being the, the baby of the family. Yeah. Um, could do no wrong, and then there was me, middle child, kind of bouncing all over the place like a flea in the jar. Um, but yeah, I, I mean, I always understood like doing the wrong thing or the right thing because mm. you know, my dad was um, my dad was pretty. Oh, I guess you know, he's classic um, Samoan, you know, like quite rigid around certain things. So you get to you, you learn right from wrong mm. pretty early in life. Um, so I understood that. I, I, you I just, just chose I just, right. I had, curi- <laughs> I had a curious nature, <laughs> and um, yeah, a bit of a fighting spirit. So I was kind of like, yeah, problematic at times. But, yeah, but nothing like it was really mm. um, terminal, you know. Yeah, 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 yeah. When did rugby sort of start for you? Rugby didn't start till I was fifteen. Oh, really? Yeah. What were you up to? Uh, prior to that, I played soccer. Oh, yeah. Um, all the way up, and then uh, cricket, lots of cricket, um, basketball, indoor netball. Loved indoor, indoor netball. Joe. Yeah, I was always down at like the um, 
the indoor cricket centre. Yeah. You know, during the oh, weeks, yeah, you yeah, know, yeah, yeah. back when you used to play like indoor cricket, then afterwards have a game of indoor netball, yeah. jump into indoor soccer. And then um, temp and bowling was real big through the through the nineties, so you know, it was a bit of a Rory Munson. <laughs> <laughs> love to love to go um, knock over some pins with the old man. It was yeah. something we did a lot as a family. We'd go and uh, dad dad's work at the time he was working for Griffin's Biscuits. Yeah. Yeah. And so he'd um we'd go we'd go down to um the Petone bowling um alley and yeah. Do like they do like nighttime bowling. It was something we did as a family. It's, yeah. it's quite cool memories because we'd all go and do it as a family. Yeah. Um, were you a big Were you a big kid? No, I wasn't. I didn't actually. I didn't because I started when I started playing rugby. I was playing first five fullback. Well, yeah. yeah. Straight from soccer to yeah, yeah, yeah. first five. Yeah. So that's why. Um, oh, then centre, but I was. You'd have laughed because I didn't like tackling at all. <laughs> really? Like, oh, I didn't like it, and I didn't know how to do it, you know? Far out. Yeah, so the yeah. first couple of years were were um, very tough in yeah. terms of trying to go from a sport that's not, not really that physical to a to a sport that's full contact. Yeah. 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 How'd you do it? I basically got run over a few times. Mm. Um, my brother was considerably bigger than me, so he was a bit of a man-child. And I remember this one time my dad was like, man, you can't tackle, you're a... You know, <laughs> chicken. And I was like, he's like, you're going to learn how to tackle. And my brother was like, at school, he was a monster. Yeah. Yeah. And we live right next door to the school. Literally, like, you open the front door and then there's the fence of the school and then there's the field there. Mm. And the old man's like, you're going to learn how to tackle? And he put me and my brother over on the on the school field and he was just standing there. Smoking darts, <laughs> <laughs> and just had my brother just running over me over and over again. It would have been felt like in an eternity, but, but it probably would have been about forty minutes. Yeah, and I don't think I tackled my brother once because <laughs> he was like, he was you know he was a man child. He was you know big. He was like six six three or something yeah. at, at school. Six yeah. two, Barrio. quite fast, quite athletic, and he was loving it because eh? I was like a run. <laughs> And the old man, I was just like, oh, on the ground. And the old man's like, yep, go again, go again. And I was like, oh. And he just kept running over me. It was only like a 10 metre space and he just literally turned around like a bull. Annihilate me, go to the other end, turn around with a smile on his face and just keep going. And yeah, my brother thought it was hilarious. Yeah. yeah. Obviously worked. Well, <laughs> eventually. Yeah, eventually, but... Yeah, my old man had some strange methods around some of that stuff, but yeah. yeah. I mean, he played me, like, at soccer, I was naturally right-footed, but I right left-handed. Oh, yeah. And he made me play left midfield. Oh, yeah. And then by the time I'd switched to rugby, I could kick equally as good off both feet. It didn't matter. Far out. Um, Underutilised so, as a lock, wasn't it? Yeah, well, I always try to. I always like try to like. <laughs> if you ask any of my age grade coaches, I would always turn up and try and be like droppies and kicks and stuff. And come on, give me a give. Me. I want to kick because um, I loved it, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, and it, it was easy, or, or not easy, but it felt natural yep. to kick because I guess all of my foundation and development was around the ball at my feet as opposed to the ball in my hands. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And and so yeah, I was always trying to like. Um, find a way to see if I could get it a few kicks away. Yeah, I kicked for the New Zealand schools. Oh, did you? Yeah, and Joe Smith was our coach. So, how'd you make New Zealand schools? Weirdly enough, like I, you're supposed to play. Um, so I played two years at Lock, or yeah, oh, sorry, at, um, in the backs. Mm. And I started, but I kind of dabbled, but was still playing soccer mainly in under 15s. Oh yeah, and then. Jumped in the backs and then played second year, like committed to rugby as a back. And then I had like a, a growth spurt. Oh, yeah. And they're like, nah, you're not playing in the backs anymore. And you can't tackle. <laughs> <laughs> so we need to hide you. <laughs> <laughs> and I was playing lots of basketball at the time. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, the first 15 coach, Barry Top, um, he he just kept pestering me to come and play lock. And I, yeah, I kind of relented and. I was loving my basketball, and so I went and gave it a go. Didn't really like scrumming. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I was like, what's this? <laughs> this is playing up. <laughs> um, 
But, yeah, and then just kind of went really well, you know. Mm. Um, I guess it was a combination of all the other sports and the game started to make sense to me. Yeah. Yeah, and then things started to click and then I got a little bit braver, Yeah, you know, because I'd, I'd kind of been, I've had, I'd had more exposure. You yeah. Know? I'd never had any technical coaching around it at that that early part, you know, it was the days where they just lined up the tackle bags and yeah. go and jump just, into just, it. Yeah, you're like flying and you're like, yeah. But as, <laughs> soon as, someone, but as soon as someone was in front of you, you're like, oh, I don't know. Um, you know, and so I, I guess I got a bit braver and then kind of you, you figure things out. Yeah. Um, and I remember we had like a central region tournament and you had to play in that to kind of be picked for the central region team to play against the northern regions mm. and whatnot. Um, and I missed out. On, I, I I got sick. I got pneumonia. Oh, yeah. And then so I didn't actually go into the central regions. Um, but for some reason Paul Cathersides, I think, was the head coach, and then um, Joe Schmidt was the an assistant coach. But they came and watch watch me play. I can't remember who we were playing, but I remember that we scored in the corner. I was kicking for the first fifteen. We scored on the right-hand touch line, and I didn't realise that they were standing right there. But um, I drained the conversion <laughs> oh, sideline with my left foot. The goal-kicking lock. And then we scored on the left touch line, and we put the ball up and drained it with my right foot. <laughs> <laughs> Honestly. <laughs> That's so good. But, and they were just like, you know, yeah, what's going on with this kid? Like, yeah. He's a lock. And so, yeah, when I made the New Zealand schools, we went over to play in Aussie. Jerry was the captain. Um, we played Australia A in Coffs Harbour, I think. And Ross Soper was our first five. Oh, yeah. Yeah, from Nelson Court. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Nelson Boys. Good man. And um, any kicks outside of, like, 35 metres or 40 <laughs> metres, I'd take. Yeah. Because <laughs> I could, you know, just, I could bang it. Yeah. And, um, yeah. That's cool. But then after that, like, I just kept getting kind of shut down because everyone was into like, specialist positions. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, Losers. <laughs> like, your courage, you know, yeah. come on. But um, I ended up kicking, uh, I, I, I've got a professional goal kicking record, 100%. Yes. Who was that for? I, Marlborough? No, I kicked for Wellington. Oh, did you? Yeah. When was that? My last game. Oh, was it? North Harbour. Oh. Yeah. Got one from the sideline. Was it sideline? Yeah. Oh. Oh, just in from the sideline, about 10 or so metres. Oh, yeah. And then, um, and then one from in front. Oh, all yeah. right. That's yeah. cool. So, retired with a... Best kick it in the world, either. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Two kicks. <laughs> well, you're obviously just like a natural baller. Or, or was there a fair bit of hard work going on in the background? Or was it pretty natural talent and just multi-sports that had turned you into the player that you were I think the multi-sports kind of fed yeah. into a lot of it and, and you know helped with the spatial awareness and I was more of a link I was never really kind of like the dude that uh, just ran you know like Jerry yeah, yeah, yeah bang the door down and you know I could I could do that but not not to the same um, intensity and for the same yeah. duration of a game I, I, I preferred to run in space and be a link and be a pair of hands and then get a second touch and yeah. a touch and trying to understand those, I guess, those anticipation moments within a game. Mm. I think a lot of the sports that I play, like, you know, soccer, you've got to move the ball up the field in triangles or, mm. you know, say a netball's a similar type of, uh, indoor netball's a similar type of game, and, mm. or, or basketball as well. So I love those moments of trying to read, play, and then put myself into a position yeah. to receive a pass, to then give a pass, to then try and keep the ball going. Yeah, that's um, cool. Um, so... Um, but there was there was a fair amount of work. Yeah, yeah. I think I floundered for a long time, like because I didn't go into professional rugby until I was, um, I think I was like twenty three, just turned twenty three. Oh really? Yeah, oh so yeah. I kind of, I fucked around for a few years. Yeah. You know? Did you think it was going to be? Was it always a goal, professional rugby? Um, yes and no. Yeah. I mean, yeah. You know, I just I loved playing the game. Yeah. Yeah, and so. Um, I had to be pushed by a number of people to kind of really commit to it. Mm. Um, I remember, uh, was it, was it um, Andrew Bedmore? Like I'd been in the academy and stuff and then kind of come out the other side, but I was just, 
I was just happy kind of hanging out with my mates and mm. not really, like, I was good at r- playing rugby, but I wasn't really, like, committed to being a professional. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, and so um, I remember getting told by uh, Andrew Bedmore at the time, he's like, well, you either pull finger or you're not getting another crack. And then Chris Boyd kind of, um, he, he echoed that same sentiment, going, y- you're talented, but you're, you're wasting a lot of it because you just don't, you don't... Um, you don't commit to anything. Mm. You just kind of float. It's like you got one chance to kind of um, it's your last chance, really. And so um, I was like, oh, okay. And I hadn't, I hadn't, I'd been on the fringe of the Wellington team, but I hadn't quite cracked it. Yeah. And then um, I was always making excuses mm-hmm. as to why I couldn't do this and why I wasn't like that. And I guess, like a lot of the young guys that I see now, who just didn't come through those. Um, High schools that have big rugby programs, yeah, yeah, just just a bit of a bit of a maverick, mm. and um, I quit my job and just committed to it for three months, and then made the Wellington team, and then that was basically the the start of my pro- professional career. That's cool. What job were you doing before that? Um, I was working as I was working for um, shipping container company. Oh yeah. Uh, and I was bouncing between that and landscaping. Oh yeah, yeah. So and you were quite content doing that, or yeah. Uh, well, it was, no, it was a job. Yeah, I just guess I was just young and um, I was just enjoying life. Yeah, yeah. yeah. You know, I wasn't um, didn't really want to be bound by yeah too many restrictions. I was just happy kind of just going with the flow. Yeah, but with no real goals or um, or drive to kind of push towards something. Mm. You know. You know, I've probably done a lot of my learning as an adult, and heaps of it's come out, come by way of rugby because a lot of the coaches you coach by are teachers. Yeah, you know, um, that's that's what they, you know, what they wear before they become yeah. rugby coaches, and they they layer in a lot of uh, subliminal messaging <laughs> and stuff, and you know, you get a slow penny drop. Yeah, and all of a sudden you're doing something one day, and then you're like, oh fuck, that's what he was talking about. <laughs> you know, and things yeah. kind of like. Massively hit, hit that way, and I'm yeah. sure you've had a few of those moments. Um, um, you know, since since you retired or on, yeah. on your rugby journey, yeah. Um, and so, yeah, I've, I've probably that kind of started my actual investment in, in trying to learn and um, just improve myself. Yeah, yeah. And what was it like going into that Wellington side? Twenty three years old. Pretty intimidating environment, I'd imagine. Well, yeah, all the big dogs. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> all, all the big dogs. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The likes of um, Jonah and Tunner and yeah, um, and Cully. You know, that was it was it was it was pretty surreal. Yeah, but then I had heaps of my mates there, like Ma and um, obviously I grew up with Jerry. On what like, grew up playing with Jerry. Yeah, know, yeah, yeah, not in the same part of Wellington, but. We played in all our age grade teams. Oh yeah, yeah, together. Um, and then there was Rodders, and and then you had the likes of Namir and Pity coming mm. through. Um, who were the same? We all kind of made it at the same time. Snakey came in at the same time. Yeah, um, which was which was pretty cool. You know, it was a really talented team, and it was kind of balanced with old heads and young guys. Yeah, and um, yeah, it was cool. Jason Spice and David Howell. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. They were, they were. I remember like spicy in that day. He was, fuck, he was, he was ruthless to me in the first year. He would just constantly climb into me. What for? Just anything. Yeah, yeah, anything. Make a mistake. Walking. You know, oh like, yeah, yeah, Not yeah, getting yeah, out yeah. fast enough. Like he was yeah. just into me all the time. I was like, hey, what's this guy's deal? <laughs> I'm like, Man, I must have really pissed him off. Yeah, yeah. But he told me at the end of year when we were having having a few beers, he was he was he was pretty boozed, and he was like, oh. And was sitting there, and he beat me with a cigarette, and I was ah. Oh. <laughs> you know, I've been writing you all year. Of oh, course, why have you been such an asshole to me all year? After he did that, he was like, he goes, he goes, I ride you because I think you're actually talented. Yeah, yeah. He goes, you should be worried if I don't talk to you. That's cool. Yeah, and I was like, oh. He goes, he goes, oh no, you go all right, mate. Mm-hmm. Like, just keep going, but don't don't let off. You know, mm-hmm. yeah, it was quite. It was actually quite 
quite cool to, I don't know if he'll remember saying that, but yeah. I remember it because he burnt me with a cigarette. <laughs> <laughs> Still got the scar. Yeah, like, <laughs> that's, what, that's what prompted me to ask the question, <laughs> why are you such an asshole? <laughs> um, but it was actually it was actually good advice to hear. Yeah. Because then it made me, um, it made me realise that, you know, that they're not being, like, demanding from each other. Yeah. Is, is not him having a personal attack at me and to not take it personally. He just wants to see the best for me because the team needs the best for me. Mm. And so it was actually it was actually really, really good advice, you know, and, and, and not to be, like, um, afraid of being, you know, challenged by your mates yeah. on the field. Um, it really kind of, like, just got rid of that, that, that piece of internalising um, your own kind of crazy concoction of what you thought he was thinking, you yeah, know? Yeah, yeah. And, um, and then after that, it was like it became really enjoyable because you weren't walking around on eggshells. You're mm. just like, well, he's yelling at me because I'm not doing my job properly. So I've just got to, I've got to go harder or be more accurate or move faster or something, you know, whatever it was that you were getting yelled at. Yeah. It's not personal. It's we all need to kind of, we all need to pull our weight. Mm. And once you were in there, what was... Were you a professional athlete, or what was your professionalism like? Especially oh, terrible, terrible. Yeah, yeah. No, I, no idea. Yeah. I thought I had an idea, but I had no, <laughs> I had no idea. You know, like yeah. we'd, we'd, we'd um, train hard, mm. love training hard, love getting in the hole. You know, but would equally go and play hard as well. We'd go out midweek, you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, stuff like that with the boys. You know, a few of the young fellas would sneak out and. Um, midweekers, post games, you know, kick ons. Mm. Um, so yeah, didn't really, you know, no real kind of um, understanding around nutrition, nutrition and stuff like that. Just, yeah, just trained hard, try to out train a bad diet and bad habits. <laughs> yeah, you know, <laughs> um, like, oh yeah, well if I'm doing this, I've got to go harder. Yeah, you yeah. know, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you were training real hard. Though. Oh yeah, real hard, <laughs> like extra runs and all sorts of. Um, but it was just. That was kind of the culture at the time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. But there was still, obviously, professional rugby had only been going for you know a handful of years, and everyone was working it out. Yeah, everyone was figuring it out, and there was still a lot of, um, I guess, club um, or amateur. Um, uh, I guess what do you call it? Amateur components of the game that yeah, still yeah, existed. Yeah. yeah, and so yeah, it yeah. was. It was it was a good time to be a <laughs> professional rugby player because it was still uh, um, lots of fun to be had. Lots of fun to be had, yeah. <laughs> like, like you know, there was just as much emphasis on beers post game as there was, you know, uh, preparing pre game. Yeah, yeah. So it was a good time. And then you end up down at the Crusaders. How, how does that opportunity come about? Yeah, played that one NPC. Finally got a crack, and then um, you get a phone call because I, or, you know, obviously growing up in Wellington, I just wanted to be a hurricane. Yeah. And, um, and and play with my mates, you know. And then I get a phone call from Colin Cooper, who was coaching at the time, and he said, oh, you, you haven't made the um, the squad. Mm. And I was like, oh, yeah, okay. Pretty gutted, you know, because I thought I'd, um, at the time I thought I'd done a decent enough showing throughout NPC, but then when I look back now, I was like, well, I didn't. I hadn't actually nailed in a starting spot, you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I had a couple of good games here and there, but didn't really kind of, um, you know, own my position. And and he, Colin Cooper was like, "Oh yeah, you, but you, you and a friend, you're going somewhere else." I was like, oh, "Who's that friend?" And he's like, "Oh, Scott Waldron." And I was like, "Oh, yeah, Scooter." <laughs> <laughs> and and um, but he didn't tell me where we were going. And then I get another phone call, and it's. Robbie Deans, and he's a, he's away with the world at the World Cup at that time because it's two thousand three, and he's like, oh yeah, congratulations, um, you, you've made it, you're a Crusader, and I was it was a weird feeling, yeah, because I was like sitting there, you know, you, you grow up in the Wellington region, kind of like everything's aligned towards the Hurricanes and stuff, and then I just got told that I've gone to uh, the defending champions, <laughs> I was like. I just, for me, you know, I was like, I can't make 
the Hurricanes, but I can make the defending champions. Yeah. But it's only because I didn't actually understand how the system worked. Like they had a protected 28 or something like that. The draft, the old the draft, draft system. And, yeah, yeah, that's right. And so just lack of knowledge and information meant that I just didn't understand. <laughs> I was like, how can I make this team and not that team? You know? And I was like... <laughs> and anyway, so it was kind of weird, you know? It was yeah. a weird feeling. I was stoked to be playing Super Rugby and excited, but also... Um, you know, it weirdly, like initially, just kind of gutted that I hadn't made the Hurricanes. Yeah, and then became a little bit spiteful. I was like, "Well, you'll never have me." <laughs> <laughs> so I was like, "Right, I'm never going back ever." <laughs> and I got asked heaps to go back. Did you? Yeah. Oh yeah. Stay true to your word. And I was just like, "Nah, I'm not going back <laughs> ever." <laughs> um. And yeah, came down and loved it. Mm. Loved it down here. Like I, I think it actually made me, changed me, changed my whole perspective on the world. Um, you know, a lot of great life lessons um, that I learned were in the red and black colours. Mm. Um, yeah, it was it was really kind of eye opening for me because I think I'd just been in my own bubble in Wellington the whole time and. To actually get out of the region, open your eyes to other ways of, of, of doing life and be questioning around your current methods and beliefs, mm. um, you know, was was really kind of liberating for me. Yeah. Yeah. What was the biggest change? I guess just, just leaving behind, um, just being in a new environment mm. was the biggest change because I, I had to learn about it. I couldn't, I didn't know where all the, I guess in Wellington I had, all the nooks and crannies that I could go and slip into and hide when yeah, I needed yeah, to. Yeah, um, there were easy outs for me, but in Canterbury, you were basically you come down here and everything was new. All my relationships were new, apart yeah. from living with Scooter. Oh, you were living with Scooter. Yeah, oh, jeez, yeah. <laughs> it's a podcast in itself. Probably. Yeah, yeah, no, it is. <laughs> <laughs> Eli Street. <laughs> um, yeah, that would be his own episode, and. Um, and, yeah, just because you're constantly kind of, I guess, being assessed and uh, critiqued and, and, and observed, yeah, yeah, you got, you got broken down pretty quickly um, as to, and then presented with, well, this is who you are because this is how you behave and this is what you say but this is what you do, you know? Yeah. Yeah, and, um, yeah, it was... Like I look back and it was actually the best thing that ever happened to me. Yeah. You know, around in terms of my rugby. Um and me learning to be a professional. Yeah. Yeah. Um yeah, it was it was really, really, really cool to just go to a completely new environment, um, have to actually toe the line mm. and adhere to what the what what the culture demands from yeah me. yeah I remember Frank C always talking around how he used to room with you every <laughs> every week because I think he was the only one who didn't care that you smoked or yeah, something yeah. so everyone else obviously um, the new environment probably a little bit more professional down here might have felt like that um, but you being a big big smoker like were you yeah. a big smoker all the way through yeah 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 and you and Frank Frank C was the only one who didn't yeah. really care. <laughs> <laughs> Frankie, because Frankie came in a couple of years after I'd been in the team. Right? Oh, really? So I oh, already okay. kind of, I'd already established myself. <laughs> I, like I used to terrorise him as a roomie. Yeah, um, just so bad. Eh? <laughs> and he'd just be sitting there because he was so professional. You know, he's like one of the, him and him and Oe are probably two of the most diligent, yeah, um, athletes. You know, definitely. Um, in terms of commitment, like there's there's no two other players. You know that I'd been exposed to over the time. They're as diligent as those guys around meal prep, mm -hmm. training, focus. You know, um, both of them equally funny dudes. You know, yeah, when yeah. you kind of spend time with them, you know, really dry sense of humour. But I, yeah, I used to terrorise Frank C as a roomie. I was just, I, I could like I developed good behaviours, but then every now and then I'd fall <laughs> off the wagon, and he was usually a recipient of me falling off the wagon because he had to live with me, and. Um, and um, he sent me this hilarious email. I remember he sent this email. It was so long um, after I left New Zealand. And um, 
it was like, oh, I just got to Bayon, and then I get this email. It's from Pim Franks, and he goes, hey, mate, um, just had my first day with my new roomie. <laughs> and he's like, I found it. I feel a sense of loss. And, uh, it's really well put together. <laughs> he was like, you know, walking in the room to to find that the room's clean, doesn't stink of two packs of cigarettes, and no one's pissed on my bag of clothes. Um, he goes, as refreshing but somewhat sad name because now I, he goes, now I have to return the favour to the new to the new roomie. It was it was really well written. I was sitting there. Sitting there laughing, eh? Because I was like, "Oh, that is so good." And the fact that he waited, yeah, till you know, he left, <laughs> till I left to actually construct an email, then send it to me was like, it was really good. Yeah, yeah. I just remember sitting there in my backyard in France, just cracking up, going, "That is so good." That's funny. Um, and what about like on the field um, for the Crusaders? Um, How did you find it playing? Oh, I loved it. Yeah, yeah, loved the style of um, rugby that that um, we were doing. I think. At the time, we were the only team that was really playing in a shape. The two four two, two four two, that's right. Yeah. And it was, you know, well ahead of other other um, places who were still playing your traditional off nine. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Off ten around the corner, and then yeah, swinging. Um, but it wasn't like a rigid two four two where you have to be here. Yeah, you're here. I want you to work hard to get into one. Yeah, you're a good cleaner. <laughs> <laughs> you know, we, whereas nowadays, eh, some guys don't get to touch the ball. Oh, I want you to work really hard into one. You've got great work, but you're a good cleaner. Like the physical moments of the game, and it's where it's at for you. It's your wheelhouse. In other words, don't touch the ball. <laughs> um, but it was it was more fluid. Yeah, know, and but it was just more general locations. So that we could be organised, you know, yeah. it was organised chaos, and did heaps of stuff around counter attack, uh, kick return, heaps of those 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 moments in the game. It was awesome. I loved it. Mm, suited your skill set. Yeah, yeah, it really suited my skill set. Yeah. Skill set. Like Wellington could play like that any day of the week, right? Yeah. Um, but they didn't necessarily spend the same amount of time focusing on it. Whereas down here, um, a lot of large elements of the game were centred around mm. those moments and um, if you look back I guess through that era there's a lot of like amazing tries that were scored yeah by way of like your transition yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. and you went on three titles down here yeah yeah yeah, yeah it was and it's 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 been quite cool because they're all like in all three of those I was operating in a different different capacity in the team you know one was on the bench um one was starting, and then one I wasn't even in the twenty-three. Yeah, you know, um, and so learning to understand that winning's winning, irrespective of your position in the team, mm -hmm. and um, and you, it's not just that game that day; it's all the, it's all the body of work leading yeah. up to it that you've made a significant contribution to the team and that's just as much your success as it is the person who's holding up the trophy yeah and I try and help players understand that like you know you can only pick 23 guys um, and it's it's understanding that those 23 are the lucky ones that get to represent and, and, and you know be able to kind of go out and deliver mm -hmm the body of work that the other 16 or so that don't get to put the jersey on have created for the year. Mm -hmm. and, and and they have a responsibility to you to make sure that, you know, yeah, yeah, yeah. you know they respect what you've done through the year, you know, whether it's been... Um, and, and you take pride in, like, yeah, win, win a championship, you know? Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Because I helped. You know, I trained hard. I turned Set up. them up. Yeah, I, I turned I turned up every week with mm. an awesome attitude to try and help prepare the team to make sure that they could win, so that we can win. Mm. You know, we all win. Um, that's that's one thing that I learned around uh, winning down here was it's it, it takes the whole village. It's not just the the council. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like it. Powerful. And then off the back of the year that you won it when you were starting, 
Is that the year you make the All Blacks? No. no Bench. No, because we, it was 2007 I made the All Blacks. Oh, wow. Yeah, so it was in between titles. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And, yeah, just, I don't know, things kind of started to click at that level. It took me a little bit of a, like, I was playing good, you mm. know, but not really kind of cutting loose, and it wasn't until, like, 2007 that I really kind of had my straps. How old were you at that point? Fuck, I was old as. Were you? Yeah. 28. Oh, 28, when you made your All Black. Yeah, I, was, I, I think I'm like the third, <laughs> second or third oldest lock. But hey, the message and uh, persistence and That's resilience, it. mate. Well, you only started playing when you were 15, yeah. so. Yeah, yeah, well, yeah, I guess if you go by that, it's. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and how'd you find out, like, that you were an All Blacks always? Oh, um, we'd just come back from Tonga because it was with the, the um, Junior All Blacks at the time. I oh, made the yeah. Junior All Blacks and. Um, Fozzie and Coops were the coaches. We just came back from Tonga and we were having <laughs> we were having beers in the room. <laughs> <laughs> I think um, who was there? Beaver was there. Um, uh, what's his name? First five. Stephen Brett. Yeah. Flinny. Usual suspects. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, and the manager comes and knocks on the door. <laughs> says, "It's a phone for you." And it was Graham Henry. <laughs> I thought it was one of the boys taking the piss and I hung up on him. <laughs> Russ, dead here. I was like, fuck off. It's not dead. <laughs> Who is this? That's <laughs> no, Graham Henry. He gave me a laugh, hung up. <laughs> and just like, no, no, no. And I was like, oh, shit. And then um, they flew us down to Wellington, or flew me down to Wellington to join the team. Got to the airport and I'd, I'd had bugger all sleep. And um, I think it was Aaron Major, um, Steve Hansen, Wayne Smith, and who was the other person? Can't remember the other, it's another player. I think it might have been Richie. And they they pulled me into the cottage lounge and I was sat there for like two hours. <laughs> and they were like talking to me about all this code and I was sitting there, I was like, oh my God, in my head, I was like, I'm going to fall asleep. <laughs> I'm so tired. <laughs> my eyes. <laughs> and I was sitting there and I was just trying my best to like hang in and I was like, fuck, I'm going to be in so much. Like, they're going to they're gonna just tell me to fuck off, you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, um, <laughs> and then we sit there and it gets to like the end of two hours and then Shag's like, right, oh, cop. That's enough for today. <laughs> He's like, Go get in the car and go and have a fucking sleep. <laughs> so I drove over, I was like, oh my God. They just get me there just to put me in it because they want to see me and just being like, look at this bag of shit. <laughs> We're just going to put him in one, you know? But what it did was like, I went home, slept, um, I guess collected myself. And when I turned up to the environment, mate, I had like a rod through my back, eh? Yeah. Yeah. I was like, that, that, that grilling and kind of just, I could, like, because you know, like, Steve is a cop. I'm pretty sure they would have been like, this guy's been slain. We're going to make sure that we sit him down and we're just going to keep him in it, you know, yeah. and see if he fades yeah. or something. I don't know. But, um, yeah. But I, I, it really kind of established what the standards were right then and there. Yeah. You know? And, and then, um, yeah, when I turned up, I was like, I'm not going to put a foot wrong. Don't say anything. You know, just train hard. Be quiet. No mistakes. You yeah, know? yeah, yeah. Um, and, and because, you know, like, it kind of made me snap out of it too because I actually got to the point where I thought, oh, it's not going to happen, you know. Uh, yeah, Junior All Blacks might be just a nice little, uh, oh, yeah, well, there's no one else in the country. Mm. So. Um, and I got called in as an injury replacement because Ali had broken his jaw. I think he did oh, yeah. Chabelle's forehead or something like that. That's right. Um, and I think every other lock in the country had been injured as well. <laughs> really? Or oh, was that a massive <laughs> yeah, injury? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was like, I was like seventh. So did you feel super uncomfortable in there? Or yeah, 100%. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. I did. I did. I mean, I was grateful. Yeah. And I got to start the following week, which oh, was yeah. awesome because then, you know, like, it wasn't like I went and just trained and trained and trained and then went out the other side and never actually got kept. Yeah. But I started the next week. Um, 
got told I played really, really well, and that was against Canada, and then got named on the bench against South Africa, the South African test for Durban. Yeah. And I was like, shit, I must have played well, you know, to be honest. Here we go. Yeah. And then they put me on like five minutes after half time. And it was a game we played in Durban where we kind of came back, we were losing at half time, and we came back and won the game. And that was awesome. Yeah. I was like, oh, shit, maybe I've actually made a fist of this. And then got named again for the following week um, where we played uh, the Wallabies at the MCG off the bench and the game got injected early but then I, I bloody blew up my shoulder and neck I hit Nathan Sharp's hip oh yeah and then I had to but we had, the bench was empty and it, I had to play the rest of the game and I just couldn't <laughs> running around like, how long was that it would, it would have been about 20 minutes to go oh and I was struggling out, yeah. kind of pushing the scrum um, so I'd blown out a disc in my neck and, and done all the labour in my shoulder and the coaches obviously knew that yeah, they, kind of. They, they, well, they did, but they couldn't get me off because there was no one to replace me with. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so they were just like, you're just going to have to keep going. Yeah. I'm running around. I was like, this is a test match. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, and this is only my third one. Like, I was like, I'm never going to play again because I'd missed a couple of tackles. Yeah. I couldn't lift my arm. And um, we lost that game, but it wasn't my fault. <laughs> <laughs> it's because I had to stay on injured. <laughs> <laughs> but, but, yeah, we, we lost that game and it was... Yeah, it was that was really tough because that's when you realise the weight of that juicy. Yeah, yeah. And, and involved, that, that would be hard, especially knowing that you're not at a hundred percent too. No yeah. one else knows that. None, none of the public would have known mm. that. And yeah, yeah. And you're sitting there and you want to perform. And you're like, you want to tell yeah. everyone that. Yeah. Oh my shoulder, <laughs> my shoulder's gone. Yeah. But um, you can't. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Just sign it. some graphics, please. <laughs> His shoulders hurt, but he's hanging in there. <laughs> but yeah, and um, yeah, it was. It was. I realised the full weight of that jersey after that loss. Eh? Yeah. Yeah. When the All Blacks lose, it's not a good thing. Mm. Not 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 within that environment. Yeah. Um, and the pressure, eh? Far out. It was yeah. And because I'd come from not your, your, your <laughs> conventional pathway, you know, yeah. it's just like, oh, how do you deal with pressure? Fuck, well, how I've always dealt with it, you know, just don't have beers with the boys. <laughs> I didn't know how to deal with it, you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and then that kind of led into uh, the Tri Nations final, Blaisley Cup final in mm. Auckland, where a few of us went out, and then um, as, as Dirty Dirties, it, Stayed out too late, and someone slipped the note under Graham Henry's door, and all of us got dropped. Apart. Oh, true. Yeah. So were you named to play? No, no, no. I nah. was. I was out injured. Oh, yeah. Yes, yeah, so I was yeah, yeah. unavailable to play, but um, we just went along to some kind of like you know uh, um, non twenty three. You know, guys went out, yeah, yeah. Had dinner, and yeah, and we all came broke curfew, got back too late. Um, I think the only one that got back on time was Andrew Hall. But um, everyone else was too late and all of us got dropped apart from Conrad. Dropped from the squad? Yeah, we didn't make the World Cup squad. Wow. Yeah, I don't think I was going to make it anyway, Yeah, to be fair, but because the likes of Keith Robinson and Ali were kind of on their way back. Yeah. Um, and then obviously Reuben Thorne was there covering lock and six. So, uh, you know, you look at it and I was, like, I was probably unlikely to make it anyway. Yeah. Um, I think my injury definitely contributed to that being an easier decision for them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, uh, but, yeah, the final nail in the coffin was broke curfew. Yeah. Yeah, and, yeah, the only one who made it out of that group was Snakey. So, yeah. Yeah, and then we got we got told, we got pulled in, we had a conversation with the coaches, and <laughs> I remember they were like, oh, on a scale of... Uh, one to ten. How drunk did you get last night? <laughs> I, was like, I think I said I was about four. <laughs> four or five. Goes around to pity. Pity's, pity's still wasted. How drunk? He's like, nine. <laughs> it's like, nine. <laughs> I was like, pull yourself together, man. Far out. <laughs> but. Yeah, I remember trying not to laugh because eh, he was like nine, <laughs> and 
then after that, we we all got the team kind of disbanded. You know, they, they um, go back before they name the World Cup squad or whatever. Yeah, disassemble. <laughs> we had to fly back to Wellington, and I remember going to the Cotter Lounge at Auckland Airport, and it's what seemed like everyone was sitting there because it was the days without social media and stuff yeah. like that. But everyone seemed to have a bloody New Zealand Herald. <laughs> <laughs> it had all our faces, the six guys or seven guys that were out too late, you know. Yeah, yeah. Um, and we didn't do anything bad. Yeah, we were just late, you know. And 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 obviously, you know, the night before, uh, um. Before a Tri Nations Cup, you know, game. Yeah. Um, I guess you know now. I understand. You know, as a coach, it was it was more the the fact that if someone had got injured. Yeah. One of us was going to be injected. <laughs> you know, at a nine. <laughs> at a nine. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and so it was just again another lesson. Yeah. You know, yeah. Like um, that, I had to learn the hard way. Did you know that was going to be your last? Involvement? Well, it wasn't. Oh, it wasn't? Yeah. You had another crack. Yeah, got called back the next year. Oh. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, so that was 2007. Yeah. Missed out on the World Cup. And like I said, I didn't know if I was actually going to make it, but um, probably not. Yeah. You know, that's cool, you know. And then I went, I was out injured for ages, missed NPC. Uh, because of my shoulder and my neck, ended up having surgery, um, and then went to I think two thousand and eight. I was getting things. That was the same time that went back. I had my shoulder fixed, leading into the start of Super. Um, blew my neck out. Yeah, yeah, and it was an accident. Um, and I always laugh about this with Oi. <laughs> Thomas, for ages I gave him shit like, like you were my, were my neck and he's like oh no like, but like the Franks brothers eh, they were they were either walking smashing <laughs> in terms of like intensity you yeah, know yeah and yeah we were doing like some pick and go drill or something but it was just more organisational oh he just smoked me right on top of the head with the head shield yeah and it just blew out like two discs shit yeah in my neck I ended up getting surgery off that, and I missed pretty much the whole of the 2008 season. Came back at the back end, but it was um, it was a bit late to kind of really establish establish yourself back into the team. And mm. um, I wasn't really in flow with the group, but that was when Ali came down, so uh, not a bad replacement, probably <laughs> better. <laughs> <laughs> and and yeah, so I missed missed that part, but then I went back to NPC. After that comp, so again, you know, in a different capacity yeah. in terms of winning a championship, had to kind of, you know, come back from injury to be able to get myself onto the field, which you know did did that and got back and played. I think I played like two, two or three games that season, but it was to overcome that injury, get back on the field and play for me was success in itself, mm. and then to obviously be a part of the team and, and win that two thousand and eight title was also awesome. Um, but you know, I was had my own personal goals where I, I guess I wanted to be an All Black again and wanted to nail it. And I did really kind of personally feel validated that I was an All Black, even though I'd played for the All Blacks because I hadn't been named in an All Black squad. Oh, yeah. I'd been called in and yeah, called in as injury cover, and so I was like, oh, I still don't really consider myself an All Black because I was, I was like, we well, only made it because every lock in the world got injured <laughs> <laughs> and. <laughs> there was no one left. You're standing in the corner, like. <laughs> <laughs> and so that's that was how I was feeling. You yeah. Know? And so I wanted to make the All Blacks. And so NPC that the India tour in 2008 was a real kind of target for me. And so I tried to try to nail NPC, and then yeah, kind of got got selected and then made that India tour. But I quite often say to the players now that I work with like. I set my goals too low because mm. I didn't realise, you know, just didn't know. Um, and I wasn't told or, or shown, you know, um, or no one shared with me. Like, I, I, my goal was to be an All Black. Yeah. Well, nothing wrong with that, is there? Mm. My goal should have been to be a great All Black, you know? Yeah. 
but a difference. You know, you've got to behave a certain way. You've got to start doing things the way a great All Black does. I just, I was happy to get there. And once I got there, I was like, yeah, I've done it. Mm. Whereas, I set my bar too low, you know. Is that what stopped you playing more games for them, you think? I reckon. Yeah. Because I reckon my attitude reflected what my goal was. Yeah. Yeah. And so, once I got there, I was like, oh, I've done it. You know, whereas if I'd been a, wanted to be a great All Black, well, what does it take? Well, making it's only the first step. Yeah. You know, um, whereas I felt like I'd done all the steps and yeah, yeah, achieved yeah. it. Yeah, it's interesting. And so, you know, my, my mindset wasn't right. And to be fair, like, would I have been an international lot for a long time? Probably not because I was too short for what they were wanting. They wanted a, everything was two metres and above. Mm. Could I play lock six? Yep. I could have definitely been that Reuben Thorne role. Mm. Um, but I just didn't have like myself wired the right way to be able to go to that space and and actually nail it. Mm. Yeah. yeah. And so I quite often talk to players now. I was like, mate, if your goal, like, what do you want to be? And they're like, oh, I want to be an All Black. I was like, well, what does that mean? Yeah. Yeah, tell me what that means. And they're like, oh, you don't want to do this, this and this and become an All Black. And what happens once you become an All Black? Oh, you know, yeah, well, once you become an All Black, what? Like, why don't you change your goal? Yeah. So you want to become a great All Black, you know? Like it's great All Black because it's it's a different mindset that you have to adopt, mm. different set of behaviours, different set of values that you have to live, you know? Um, don't sell yourself short. Mm. Yeah. And so that was probably another lesson. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so many lessons. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So good to be getting them passed on by you. So do, when, how do you feel when people call you Ross Felipe, the All Black now? No, oh, no, it's, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm proud of yeah. what I did. Um, yeah, I just, um, definitely proud of what I did. Yeah. You know, like my dad was incredibly proud, my mum, my brother and my sister, you know, um, even my kids, mm. you know, they, you know, they went alive when I was playing, but that, that, they're also proud, you know. Mm. So I, I understand the the positive impact it's had on the the, the people I love. It's gone. Cool. Um, and and I guess now knowing that, like I'm trying to, I guess help other guys achieve the same thing, but better mm. in a better way, mm. you know, with the better um, better outcomes, you know, just by getting the I guess the setup. Component right, set yeah. yourself up right from the beginning. Don't don't just kind of <laughs> <laughs> float through the ether and then hope that it works out. You yeah, know? yeah. Like uh, you can actually you can design it the way you want it. You know, mm. right from the get go, and then work towards it. You know, um, yeah. Mm. So then, when you go overseas, is this because you feel like you're? Still, right down the order of sort of locks or relying on injuries, or why do you move out? I went overseas because while we we're on the end of your tour, Steve Henson comes up to me in the, <laughs> in the hallway and goes, All right, cop, what do you think of um, young Isaac Ross? <laughs> <laughs> oh, he's pretty talented. Oh, yeah, we need to take him under your wing next year for Crusaders. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and I was like, what, so you can take my job? <laughs> and he's like, go on, cop. walks off. <laughs> and I was like, well, that's me done as an All Black. That's all she wrote. Um, so yeah, I kind of knew then. I was a bit, I was, I was street smart enough yeah. to recognise it. Yeah, it's a good time to go. Self-awareness. Yeah. yeah. Better make hay while the sun's shining. And was it an easy decision on where to get go? I had a cup. I had number of offers but most of them were coming out of France yeah and could have gone to Clermont Toulouse who's the other one Stade Francais I was kind of I was, at the time I was big into my surfing yeah yeah and um, I just wanted to go for lifestyle <laughs> <laughs> so I went to went to Bayonne yeah um, and lived in Beirut mm. so awesome. you had no ambitions as a rugby player Leaving you, you weren't chasing titles. Yeah, once I went over there, yeah. initially, nah. You were just I, I happy just, to sort of clip the yeah. ticket, really. Yeah, oh, initially, yeah. yeah. And then once I got over there, going from the Crusaders to um, Bayonne, where it was like 
a bottom three team of the top 14 kind yeah. of fighting for relegation all the time. I was like, holy shit, what have I done? Yeah. Um, you know, and the frustration of being involved in good systems versus um, just a different culture, different way of looking at the game, different way of executing the game. Yeah. Um, different different attitude to teach to it. Like I was, you know, I was, became so frustrated, you know. Yeah. Um, and I just kept fighting it. So for the first, I guess for the first year, um, it was really hard to, to make the change. You were so playing seven, weren't you? When I first got there, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, <laughs> well, I got over there, I was like 100 and, 114, 115 kilos in mean condition. You yeah. Know? And um, the French was like, oh, no, you're too small for a lot. <laughs> I was like, what? I just played international rugby. Just playing South Africa yeah, last yeah, week. I, I, I just played international rugby. What, what do you mean? I'm uh, too small. And they're like, oh, no, no, you're way too small. You have to play loose forward. <laughs> so I think for the first month I was there, I was playing like open side and blind side. And, oh, right. yeah. I was loving it. Eh? Just bulking up as well. Like yeah, and then the they were just making me eat. And yeah. Then I got up to like 125. Far out. Fuck, I was struggling, <laughs> chafing a lot too. <laughs> chafing a lot, eh? I was like, far out. This is um, this is uncomfortable. And I couldn't run, you know, but it's, they just, they love, they call it like the tractors. Yeah. Yeah, they love a tractor. Just plot away and just big and, you know, size. But I wasn't very effective. I didn't play very well. Yeah. The style of rugby that, that they were playing at the time didn't really lend itself to my skill set. Yeah. So I kind of really struggled, you know, to... Find a groove. <laughs> Big hundred and twenty six kg you attract the Oh yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the ball tires. <laughs> yeah. oh, and they had heaps of coaches as well, didn't they? Like a real high turnover yeah, of coaches. Yeah, we yeah. had um I think we had like three coaches in the space of like two weeks. Yeah. Like just one dude went and then some guy just turned up and I was like, Who's this? <laughs> <laughs> he's just talking to the team. You know, two weeks later, he's gone. <laughs> well, and then, and then a new, another guy came in. Yeah, and it was that. That was kind of like my introduction to French rugby. Yeah, mm. it was like um, particularly the clubs that were sitting at the, at the bottom half of the table. There was really no security around anything. Like yeah. We had players come in, and uh, we had one player who was actually who had been staying with me. I won't say his name. Because it's, it's his kind mm. of, um, it's, you know, it's, it, was, it was a shit way to find out that he'd lost his job. Yeah. But he, he, um, he'd come in as, as a um, medical joker and he'd staying with me and we, we, we turned up to training and the coach came up to the car. He's like, what are you doing here? He's like, uh, training? And he's like, didn't you hear on the radio? You've been fired. <laughs> oh, and he had to turn around and leave. He took my car and left. And I was like, oh. I was like, what? From the radio? Yeah. Oh, didn't you hear the radio? He's <laughs> like, no. <laughs> Don't walk around with a wireless. <laughs> <laughs> it's brutal. Yeah. And so, just, yeah. That, yeah. And you know, I was like, shit. Like, no real care for the, nah, for the none. athlete, eh? Just. None. None. Um, that's where you discover it's actually, you know, the whole thing's a, it's a butchery. Yeah. You're a piece of meat. Mm. You've got to extract every drop of blood from you, you yeah, know, until they're done, and then next. Yeah. Um, How do you end up at the wasps? I ended up at the wasps through flutes. Ricky, oh yeah, Ricky, yeah, yeah, yeah. So flutes was there at the time, and um, and yeah, we kind of we were playing in that. We went in the Heineken Cup. We're in the European Championship. I can't remember what it was called. And flutes said that they needed a lock. Um, asked me if I was keen to come over. I could go over because um, my wife was um, got a British passport. Oh yeah, yeah. So I always say to the boys, that the best PD is to marry well. <laughs> <laughs> What's your lineage? <laughs> What's your dad doing? No. <laughs> <laughs> um, I was like, oh, don't worry about that. You just got to marry well. <laughs> <laughs> um, but. Yeah, and so we're fortunate enough that um, she she had a British passport, so I was able to go in because I think at the time the rules we had to have started a test within the last eighteen months or something. Oh yeah, well exceeded that, <clears throat> and um, yeah, so we went in. 
and then I ended up I played as a local because I had the um, indefinite leave to remain. True. Yeah, 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 yeah. So it was sweet. I didn't clog up the books. Yeah, yeah. Um, so that was it was quite you know fortuitous for us as a family. Yeah. And Lou Lou wasn't really um, enjoying France at the time. Language barrier. Language barrier. We had young kids, pretty isolated. You know. Did um, you have three kids at the time? I only only had the two. two. Yeah. So we just had my um, son. Cash and Kiana, yeah. our daughter. And then we went to, um, we didn't have Maya until we come back to New Zealand. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And um, so it was just the, the, the four of us when we went to England. And she really loved it. Yeah. Like, for her, it was awesome, you know. Um, she was able to kind of be a, be a, be a mum. Yeah. You know, be able to kind of organise and do things for the kids and mm. for, for the home. And I think it gave her a real sense of kind of identity back. Whereas she kind of just was in a bubble, kind of lost herself, and that's probably the hard thing I think for some people. You know, some families that go over the dynamics sometimes work, sometimes don't. Yeah, you know? I don't know how your family found it in Japan, mm. um, but it's you know the, the the language barrier, not being able to communicate and stuff is not for everyone. Yeah, um, and so it was really refreshing for her, you know, and she she really loved it in the UK. Yeah. So ended up at Wasps, and uh, Leon Holden was the interim director of rugby at the time. He's coaching Teams Valley now. Oh, yeah. Yeah, and so I signed under him. But then um, he'd left as I came in, and then Die Young. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. He came in, and, 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 you know, I like Die, good man, but he just wasn't a fan. He wanted, um, he, I think he wanted more of a South African profile. <laughs> mm which is sweet, you know. That's want the tractor. What's the tractor? <laughs> I can get there. Yeah, yeah. I just don't think I, I suited yeah, his profile. Yeah, yeah. And he, he was he was gracious enough to to share that with me, and I was like, yeah, that's cool. I mean, I signed under Leon anyway. Yeah. So, um, he was just like, look, we we just rather um, we'd rather go in a different direction. And I was mm-hmm. like, yep, yeah, that's no problem. I don't have any problem with that. Um. But, you know, signed two years, so what do you want to do? Hmm. Yeah, and then um, I got injured while I was over there. Uh-huh. And then they started they started playing a little bit of funny buggers around my yeah. my shoulder and um, I had to have shoulder reconstruction. And it was supposed to take, like, f- five months. But it, how the contracts worked was you only had a certain number of days that you could accumulate oh, to yeah. be off before they could half... Your contract, yeah, yeah, yeah. And then another certain number of days that you had to get back to playing before they could terminate, right? Yeah. And I was like, I was like, oh man, I'm fucking. you know, you're under the pump and like you're sitting there, you're looking, you're like, I've got to support my family. Mm. What do I need to do? And like, I was supposed to be five months out, which meant that they could have terminated my contract. And I was like, to Lou was standing there, you know, like, oh, what are we going to do? I was like, no, I'll get back playing. I came back from a shoulder reconstruction in three months. <laughs> wow. <Yeah. laughs> round the clock. Yeah. Um, round the clock rehab. Like waking up at one, three, Shit. five. Because I was like, nah, nah, you're not, yeah, not yeah. going to tear up my contract. And I was like, nah, yeah, it's yeah. not happening. Yeah. You know, just defiant as. And then um, played on the day, and even the surgeon was like, I, I do not recommend this. And I was like, no, nah, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to play. And they played me. Yeah. Yeah. And so I kick off. I was like, oh my God, how's this going to go? Made the first tackle. I was like, oh, it's mint. <laughs> better than I thought. It was better than my left one. <laughs> and then I was into it, you know. And they kept playing me every game. I was like, afterwards, I was like, they, they're trying to break me. Yeah. You know, but because I had no time left that I could attribute to injury. Yeah. But I managed to play the rest of the season. And then um, we, we agreed to part ways. Yeah. Shit. Um, at the end of the season, but it was, it was just like, nah, you're not going to put me and my family in a hole. Yeah. Yeah. And so it was, it was awesome. Like, Lou was so like, supportive through that period. I had to get this thing called nerve conduction testing. Have you ever had that? Nah. Oh, my God. That is like torture, eh? What is it? They, they put like a needle in because like, the nerve in my arm had gone to sleep. Yeah. Surgery. 
and I just couldn't lift my arms. So getting it mobile again, and they would like then, like put this needle in, and then they'd run a current through it. But obviously, I've just had a big surgery. Yeah, they're trying to fire up the nerve. And he goes, oh, we only do it like four or five times. I ended up having like 27 shocks. And he kept turning up the thing. I was sitting there bawling my eyes out going, stop, 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 stop. Please, please, man, don't, don't, please. Because I was crying like in the chair. And he goes, oh, we've got to do one more. And I reckon in the end he was like, he was quite enjoying it. And I was like looking at him going, please. Oh, and, and, like, yeah. and I was so traumatic, eh? Like it was so traumatic. Like I remember leaving there and I had to go and catch the tube home. I was in the chain and I was like almost rocking a little bit like holy shit that was so bad I, and when anyone's ever kind of mentioned nerve conduct testing again I'm just like being like oh the shivers yeah like it was bad eh yeah, I, yeah but I, I don't know whether it was because other people said they, they've had it but they said it wasn't that bad oh yeah and I, I, think, I think because he went it, hard on you I think well I don't know whether he went hard or, or it was because I just had a big surgery as well. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And so it was because my arm was like jolting and stuff. Yeah. Um, yeah, it was horrific. Like I was, he was about to do it and I was like, wait, 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 stop, stop, stop. <laughs> so then how do you, how do you end up in, back in New Zealand? Like, yeah, what, so during that time, yeah, I was like, shit, we've got to think of a plan. Looked around a couple of other UK clubs, but um, like, I didn't really want to move again within the UK. Yeah. Um, and, yeah, it didn't, didn't have many bites, to be fair. Um, what were you, 33? You would have been 33 at the 33. time. 33. And so I reached out to Chris Boyd. Oh, yeah. To Boydie. And then said to Boydie, hey, I'm coming home. You're looking for a lock for NPC. And he was like, yep, love to have you back. And then um, we kind of set up. We came back to Hamilton. And no, sorry, we went back to Wellington or Christchurch first because that's where Louise is from. Yeah, we stayed with her parents, and then uh, I joined the Franks. The Franks had started their um, CrossFit gym. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. And I, I rang Franksy, and I was like, "Rumi, I'm back. <laughs> <laughs> and I come smoke some darts in your gym." <laughs> and he he got me in touch with his old man Ken. Yeah, and they 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 gracious enough to cut me a little bit of a deal and I could go and train there. Um, and then, yeah, so we started here and I kind of just trained here until I just went up for testing in Wellington and then started playing. But I'd come back and I was like 128 kilos. Oh, wow. Still tracked him. Still tracked him, mate. <laughs> mate. The Kubota. <laughs> wasn't a John Deere, it was a Kubota tractor. And, um, <laughs> and um, you know, no, knowing... New Zealand rugby, which was way more familiar to me. Mm. And that was a hard thing going from French rugby to English rugby. Yeah. They play the game different again. Yeah. You know? And so, like, had to adjust to the way they played. And the space that I'd see was not the space that they play to. Yeah. You know? And so I'd be like, oh, well, why can't we do this? And they're like, what are you talking about? You know, you kind of come across like a bit, a bit of a Martian, you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And the games around the armory saw and the combat of the forwards and, you know, grinding your team out. It's way more um, fluid now, but when I was there, it was... Actually, I've got a funny story. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> Had an assistant coach, won't say his name. <laughs> <laughs> and um, we're standing there, and Welsh fella, good man, awesome man. But he's standing there, he's talking to me, he goes, you know, Ross, uh, I developed the spiral punt. <laughs> and I was like, What? <laughs> And um, he's standing there, he's trying to convince me that he invented the spiral. I was like, wait, how old are you? <laughs> and um, he, yeah, he was like, oh, you know, I'm like 56. And I was like, <sighs> <laughs> just kind of went along with it, you know, because he was a real good man. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But, but I just when he was sitting there, you know, because I, I was kicking, I was mucking around at training. Yeah. I was just kicking, and he came up to me like, hey, Ross, do you know I invented the spiral punt? <laughs> and I was like, <laughs> it was so funny. Eh? I, was, I was like, sit back, and I was like, man, that was good. <laughs> um, yeah, sorry, I digress. <laughs> Ended up back in New Zealand. Yeah. Um, Realised that, you know, understanding the game here, 
128 is way too big. Yeah. I am going to embarrass myself and, you know, so I just set about dropping dropping weight as much as I could to to, um, to be able to play the game here. And then, um, yeah, I think I ended up getting down to like 110. Oh, wow. Yeah. So I just went hard. I was doing like, Jeez, I think you're supposed to only do Frank like, Crothers. You're only supposed to do like CrossFit like four times a week or something like that. I was doing like six or seven sessions. I was double days and stuff like that, oh, just yeah, going yeah, to yeah. do CrossFit. I got so lean, eh? I was like, yeah. And then, um, but it was just so I could pass fitness testing and stuff, mm. you know, and be able to be functional because I was just, I just plotted around yeah. in the UK, you know. Um, and, yeah, it was good. Went back in, come back into Wellington, and there was a whole bunch of new guys coming through, um, Lots of Brad Shields had yeah. established himself, you know. He yeah. was, you know, he was becoming more of a, um, you know, a, a bigger name in the team. TJ had, um, Piranara had obviously, he he'd emerged. He was a young guy when I was, um, when I was last in the the Lions team. Yeah, and then, um, yeah, it was, it, it, Artie. Oh yeah, yeah, Artie had just come out of school. There was heaps of good, you know. Yeah, yeah, the yeah. Talent was Alapati Leua. Yeah. Um, you know, Thrushy had really Jeremy Thrush had really mm. kind of cemented himself as a as a starting lock and a captain, and like um, we had Richie Goods, like all these young yeah, yeah, yeah. guys who were younger when I was last here were now the the guys. Were well, you you obviously the oldest? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah by a yeah. long way. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and um, yeah, it was, and but. That was when I noticed there'd been a big shift in culture in the team. Yeah. Yeah. Real cool shift in culture. Like, I came back in, the boys accepted me straight away. Um, there was no kind of, none of that old school hierarchy, mm-hmm. you know, none of that kind of bullying <laughs> or just kind of, you know, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, old school shit. Yeah. That um, used to happen in the changing room. And so it was really refreshing. I really, really liked where Wellington was at the time. Yeah. And I really enjoyed playing with that group, you know, the second time round it was super enjoyable. Loved mm. it. Um, playing for that team. And and all a lot of those guys went on to, to have a really, really good careers, you know. Well they still some of them still are. Mm. Um and it was really it was really awesome to be involved with that team at that time. Yeah. So why'd you why'd you what, did you retire at the end of that year? No, nah, initially. Uh, and that's where I ended. That's how I ended up at the Chiefs. Oh, okay. Yeah. So I was playing more blindside. Oh, yeah. Because I yeah, lost yeah. too much weight. <laughs> <laughs> weren't big enough for yeah, lock. Yeah, again. yeah, yeah. So I wasn't big enough for lock again. So yeah. I was playing six, and then uh, that's where Renz. Oh, me. that's right. Yeah. Renz asked me to come up, but Mark Hammond had actually. Renz asked me first. Yeah. And I've always operated because I've pretty much been my own agent for I don't have. Oh, really? The whole time. Yeah. For a long time, yeah, I've yeah. had the old agent do a deal here and there, but by and large, I'd do it myself. Um, and Renz rang me and was like, uh, you know, are you keen? I was like, oh, oh yep, yeah. yeah, I am. Yeah, I'm keen. Mm. But then Hammer rang me, Mark Hammer rang me, because you were in the team at that time, weren't you? I would have probably, what year was that? 2013? Yeah, I was, yeah. yeah. Hammer rang me like, oh. What a shame. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and and he goes, I, I you know, really want you to stay. And there was a couple of things that me and Hammer had to had to kind of uh, I guess acknowledge. Yeah. From my crusader days. Mm. And it was really cool to be able to kind of put to bed some of the some of the stuff that both of us had been sitting on for a number of years. Mm. And that was really, really cool. And then I was like, oh, can't be bothered moving again. Yeah. We're in Wellington. Um, and so I said yes to him, and then I rung Renz back, and I was like, no, nah, no, nah, I'm not coming. And then um, probably later that night, uh, Louise, my wife, was like, you're not going to be happy with this. And I was like, what do you mean? She goes, like, the whole time I've known you, you've always said, if you say yes to someone, that's as good as your signature. Oh, uh, yeah. Yeah. And I was like, and I was sitting there and I was like, fuck, she's right. 
Is that the ring hammer I made? Oh. Sorry, hammer, I said yes, the ring's first. <laughs> <laughs> and he's like, oh, it doesn't matter. And I was like, no, 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 that's how I do things, you know? Yeah. Yeah. I'm going to run rings back. <laughs> so I, I could have run rings back and he could have been like, nah, it's gone. And then I would have been like, <laughs> nah. <laughs> but I just went straight to hammer. Yeah. Said to hammer, um, yeah, um, sorry, I've, I've said this. And I already agreed to it. Yeah. And then I said, I'll, you know, I'm going to run rings back. And I was like, hey, rings, uh, is that still open? <laughs> <laughs> and he said, yeah, yeah, it is. Oh, and, and so Move the family up. And so we moved up to Hamilton, yeah, and we've stayed there. Yeah. Oh, yeah, true. Been yeah. there ever since. Yeah, been there ever since. A couple of stints over to yeah. Japan. Oh, I went back to France. Oh, yeah, of course. To racing and then, um, and then, then up to Japan. But that really kind of was our introduction to the, the Waikato. Yeah. Yeah. Because then, was it? You win the title, was it that? Yeah, you win the title. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mate. Instant impact. Well, <laughs> from the from the back fence, mate. <laughs> Ren's quite often says to me, "I was the highest paid player in the Chiefs per minute." <laughs> and I was like, "Well, it's because you kept injuring me at training." <laughs> the brutal was, Thursday was, sessions. I was, there, I was like thirty four years old. I was like, bro. Well, 35 maybe. I was like, mate, like seriously, yeah, 34. Like, I, like training me like a 21 year old. Yeah, I was like, mate, okay, like you're gonna break me. He's like, nah, nah. Like, <laughs> broken, broken. Mm. Yeah, and so I just had heaps of false starts. I just couldn't get on the field. Yeah, exactly. But when I, and then I did those two years. We always laugh about it, you know, um, and you know, love. Love working under Renz. You know, yeah. Good man. I've known him since I was a kid because he's from Wellington, you know. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And, um, yeah, we, every time I run into him, he's always like, ah, oh, here he is. <laughs> <laughs> Highest paid per minute. <laughs> so, I was just like, well, yeah. is, that, is that entirely my fault? <laughs> I would have liked to have played more, but you had the world's best lock. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and the other one was your captain, you know, and I was always broken. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, and so, but really cool to go and be a part of that culture, yeah, you know, and that team, and and that actually helped us set down roots in in, in, in that that region, and mm-hmm. yeah, we love living up there now. Eh? It's it's um, it's a really good lifestyle for us and our fits our family, yeah, really really well. And it wasn't your last time with the Chiefs, so either, yeah, you no, did, yeah. Well, I did those get... two years, <laughs> and then I retired, yeah, yeah, because my body was cooked, and I tore my hamstring off the bone. A portion of it, not all of it. Yeah. In in one of the Chiefs games, and then kind of got myself back to a point where I could play NPC, but I could only really hobble around. Um, I just couldn't sprint. Mm-hmm. You know? And then um, retired. I was like, Nah, I'm done. Played my last game from Wellington. Hopped in the car the next day and just drove back to Hamilton and shit. That was it. Yeah. So I thought. <laughs> <laughs> and then Chiefs like six months or you know. However, that was. Were you staying fit? Or no, nah, I wasn't doing Fully nothing. checked out, yeah. Fully checked out, yeah. I was just like, I'm done. Started coaching club. Uh, if we'd had injuries, I'd jump on and play, but I wasn't like playing or training or anything. Yeah, yeah. I wasn't going to the gym, nothing. Um, and then deep into the Chiefs season the following year, get a phone call from Tom Coventry, hey, can you come in and train? Yeah. Yeah. And then I was like, oh, yeah, I'll come in and train. First training. Did a line out, landed, something in my back went. <laughs> so, fuck. I couldn't say anything because I was like, oh, you know, could actually do it with the training fees this week, you know, like a little bit of a top up. So I was like, <laughs> muscling it up, went and got some muscle relaxants, went to my friend's house afterwards because um, she was looking after our daughter. Yeah. And um, she, like, basically cared for our daughter while I laid with, with my legs up on the wall, trying to, like, stretch out my back <laughs> just to get through the week. Yeah. And then got through to the day off. I was like, fuck, I'm going to get through this week. And then um, come Thursday, the name the team, and I'm starting. Shit. And I was like, what? I have done nothing yeah. for like six, seven months. And you get a sore back. And my back is <laughs> killing me. But I didn't tell anyone about the back, you know? Yeah. And then, yeah, play the balls. And and then obviously, um, yeah, a lot of people know kind of how that game went. Went, went pretty well. Um and off the back of that, I was, yeah, I was rooming with Yogi, uh, Johan Bardal. Oh, that's right. Yeah. And we, we were in Rotorua, and um, 
you like a balcony on your on your room. And I just was in bed all day because it was night game and um, Yogi's like that, you know, um, he's a, the guy that attacks the day. <laughs> <laughs> Particularly if people owe money. <laughs> and, um, <laughs> and and um, we go, like, I just kept ducking in and out onto the balcony. He's like, what are you doing out there? And I was like, I was smoking, mate. And he's like, oh. He didn't didn't know that I was a smoker. Yeah. He goes, Nah, no, nah, seriously. Like, yeah, I am. He comes out this like an ashtray with like I oh, know I would have smoked like a pack of darts before that game, eh? Because I was so nervous because I knew what was coming. You know, it's not like when you're doing it for the first time and you don't know. You yeah. don't know what you don't know. Yeah. Like I knew exactly what was coming and I was like sitting in my head going, You're not ready to do this, eh? Like, physically, mentally, like you know, I was yeah. I was just like, Holy shit. Yeah. You've got to get I've got to get myself into a headspace. Because this could be catastrophic. Because I was supposed to be like calling the game, you know, off the sky. Yeah, I was, oh, <laughs> I was scheduled to do all the pregame and stuff. Oh, far out! Right, that's funny. And then, <laughs> and then, um, yeah, I was just stressing the whole day. Mm. Not not because I didn't have, well, I didn't. Yeah, no, nah, yeah, it's because I didn't have confidence in my body. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, you know, and just I was just like fuck. You know how intense it's going to be, yeah. And then Renz had put together one of the the um, like they put together a game plan that ended up being the highest ball and play game <laughs> <laughs> of that season for the Chiefs, where it was to not kick the ball out at all, yeah. And the Bulls played into it, yeah. And I was oh. <laughs> just the amount of running in that game was just insane. Eh? How long did you last? I played till 70 minutes. Oh, did you? Yeah. Oh, that's a shift. Yeah. Take 70 it. minutes. Um, yeah. <laughs> just fat man's track everywhere. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah. I just trimmed all my lines and <laughs> I was just like, don't don't chase everything. Just be useful with what's in front of you. Yeah. yeah do do the thing that's in front of you. And, you know, because there's, there's you, you do have a tendency to try and, fuck, I've got to get in the game. Where yeah. I was just like, just, just don't try and get in the game, just be in the game. Yeah. And, and be where you are. You know, don't don't worry about chasing it. Well, you knew all the lot. Like you'd, you said, you'd already started your coaching sort of yeah. path as well. Yeah. So you knew yeah. all the tricks. You yeah, knew so what like, everyone was looking for. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Made a couple of sneaky line breaks during the game. Yeah. And, you know, bits and pieces, and it was enough for um, racing to give me a call and go, "Oh, we need. Do you want to come to racing? Yeah. For the following season. Far out. And I was. What like, are you now? Thirty seven. Yeah, it would have been 36, 36. Shit. Yeah. And then 36. Yeah. Then went up to racing for the year and then we won the top 14. Another like, title. Another title, bro. <laughs> <laughs> haven't got and enough, then, then haven't you got enough done. room at home for the <laughs> All the trophies and <laughs> titles, yeah. And then after that you were done. And you knew it? Then I came back, yeah. 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 Yeah, yeah I came back after that. Oh, I played Hawks Bay. Oh, like that's right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So um, Jace Ryan. I caught up with Jason France. He yeah. actually wanted me to go down and kind of had a few injuries, and he wanted me to come down to Canterbury. And I was contemplating doing that. Um, him and Razor were coaching the team at the time to play, to play, yeah. yeah. And um, but I just logistically getting home to Hamilton and stuff. Mm. Like I wanted to be able to get back to the family. Yeah. And so I ended up just um, Hawks Bay asked as well. So I was like, oh, you know, I can drive to and from Napier. Yeah, it's easy. So I just kind of did that, but um, yeah, that was really kind of my, my last involvement in New Zealand rugby was at Hawks Bay. Mm. Um, I was keen to go back and kind of be of some support in something in Wellington, but they'd already kind of had a a number of locks come through, then, and they, you know, they were good, talented, and the future. So mm. um, Earl was coaching at the time. Oh yeah, yeah. And then, then he gets you to Japan. Yeah, yeah and then he, he rang me in, um, after that season, I think, and asked if I was interested in going up to Japan um, to coach. And I was like, oh, yeah. yeah, why not? Yeah. yeah. Did you always want to coach? Was that always the... Well, I'd coach just club. Yeah. Um, I'd coach Hamilton Maris for one season. And, um, and then, obviously, got the, I was supposed to do them the next year. And then the racing thing came through. And then I was like, wow, sorry. Yeah. <laughs> it's actually, you know, a 
to sun setting. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's a nice little nest egg, you know? So, um, um, so yeah, I kind of jumped at that. You know? mm. um, yeah. How'd you find it? How'd you find coaching in Japan? Challenging. Yeah. Very challenging. Um, it's interesting. I've, like, look back at it at the time, I was, again, another hard lesson that I had to learn. Mm-hmm. Um, I just needed to learn. I think it was good to get out of New Zealand and go and try my hand at um, coaching professionally. Mm. Um, I learned pretty quickly that I knew, like, I didn't know how to fucking use a computer, you know? Yeah. Like, all that stuff. I was really down on those kind of skills. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I felt like I could talk to players, but then I couldn't talk to players because they're Japanese. Do you know what I mean? <laughs> yeah, yeah. I and could so talk to four players. <laughs> I could talk to four players, but I, you know, yeah. Um, and so then trying to teach, like trying to learn how to coach professionally when you're having to coach through an interpreter, mm. was actually super challenging, really challenging because then you you want to try and get across your message, but I didn't realise that in, in order to do that, if your message is too long. The meeting goes for like an hour and a half. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. And so it it was, and it wasn't a true reflection, or I guess it is a true reflection of coaching in Japan, unless you can speak Japanese, right? Yeah. Um, but I guess it's not a true reflection of coaching here. And so you're sitting there and you're like, man, these meetings are long. I, I was kind of a little bit lost as to, you know, as an assistant coach, uh, what did you want to see? Mm. Um, I didn't quite know, you know, um, how to package things, you know, around sports code and stuff. Yeah. Um, so there was a lot of agonising nights where I was, like, trying to figure a lot of this stuff out. And your family weren't there either, and were they? Your family wasn't there, you know. And so I, I, um, I found it really kind of isolating and quite lonely. Mm. Um, and... I think I think Earl did his best to to try and support me in, in the background mm. around some of that stuff. I was just I just wasn't again. In a, I was in a moment of pressure that I didn't know how to deal with um, very well, mm. and because I felt like I was alone, I didn't reach out to people. didn't Didn't know what questions to ask because I didn't, you know. Yeah. I was just fucking under it, you yeah. Know? And and so, you know, I again, what do you do? What did I, you know, it's history at the time. Yeah. Um, what did I do when I was under pressure? I was fucking going, going have drinks. Yeah. Because um, I just, I just, I just needed some form of escape. Yeah. Um, and then obviously not having the family there, missing them, um, all those things. It was yeah, it was it was really challenging and really isolating. Yeah, it's, mm. um, but then I look back and there was so many good things to come out of that shit experience. Mm. Yeah, like obviously you know got to work with you, Abbo, Buck Abbott, mm. uh, the other foreign, foreigners that were there: Solomon King, Joe Tupé, Tim LaFaele, Will Tupo. Mm. Dan Holland's head, um, all those, um, Danny Peters. Yeah. You know, there was a really good crew of awesome, awesome um, people there. And Armand Ping. <laughs> <laughs> Remember him? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Monty, yeah. <laughs> He's a different cat. <laughs> um, and, and like... Really cool people, you know. Yeah. Really cool people, but I was learning to be a professional coach, you know. And I'm always going to be grateful to Earl for giving me, giving me that opportunity to actually try my hand at coaching professionally. Yeah. And um, and you know, like he, you know, gave me an opportunity, um, even though I had no real coaching coaching background. Um, you know, I'd only coached the club team once and, and, and there was a lot of things, you know, like doing club, 
literally turned up and I was like, right, what's the biggest challenge at club is time. Mm. And so I was like, right, let's, let's set up a few line out, sweet, um, whatever, you know, like get basis of a couple of strikes, right, we'll do this, um, general face play, right, we need to see what our scrum looks like, hit the scrum, everything looks square, sweet, don't need to do scrums. Yeah. Cut scrums, <laughs> yeah. one scrum session the whole year. Shit. Sure. And then we just played uh, con games. Yeah. All the con games were geared around the the transition g- grey moments in the in the game. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I was like, if we do this and we win this space, we'll win pretty much most of our games. We ended up winning the title. Oh, that's cool. But we did most of it was built around just con games and mm. I guess how they transfer into the actual game. And didn't really waste my time with scrums. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And then going from that up to you know, a Japanese team that's um, requires more structure, more um, analysis. You know, mm. all, all those things. It was, yeah, it was it was a steep learning curve. Yeah, yeah. Well, here so many times, a lot of guys who have been in Japan without their family. Mm. How many of them struggle? Obviously, Joel yep. ended up in jail. You didn't quite end up in jail, but I remember you having to leave. Um, well, no, I did. Oh, you did end up in yeah, jail. Yeah, well, he fell asleep and fell asleep in a taxi. And the taxis over there, they don't, they don't try and wake you up. They just drive you straight to the cop station. <laughs> oh shit! Get there, and the cops like, <laughs> shit. <laughs> Walk inside, lay down. <laughs> and then um, Yusui. Oh, you... remember Yusui? Yeah, 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 yeah. He had to come pick me up, eh? And I was like, fuck. And what did they say? Is that when you knew you had to? Yeah, leave? I got to the point where I was so frustrated because every time we, all the other coaches. You know, we keep going on camps. Yeah, yeah, yeah. In, in the breaks. Yeah. And they would make us go on a camp. Yeah. But the other teams would have a break. And so when when I first like talked about the, the contract, it was um, in the breaks, I'd get to go home to see the family. Mm. But then they keep shifting the goalposts because we weren't performing. But it was like, well, you know, like the team was actually – wasn't comparative to against like your <laughs> your Suntory or you know yeah these other teams that look like barbers you yeah. know and and so we're sitting there going well we've got to go on another camp and I think the longest stint was like almost seven six and a half months mm. I didn't see the family it's tough eh? yeah and then I got home and the kids had gone from here to 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 hear yeah. and I was just like I looked at them and all, all I was thinking in my head was oh shit I fucked up you know yeah, I've seriously fucked up here because I have to get to know my kids again and I don't know who they are from here to here yeah like it was it was a real like kick in the guts mm. like to you're trying to do something for your family and grow yourself but the, the reason the family didn't come was because we'd just come back from France we were trying to set down Roots for the kids because we decided like we can't just keep bouncing around yeah, yeah. with the kids because they're at the it's age where they're part, in the school eh, now, you know, like players or coaches to. Once they were into, they were, you know, getting older, yeah, we're like we actually need to establish like consistency for them, and so we decided as a family, you know, mm. um, that they'll stay in NZ and then we'll, I'll go up, but I, I was under the premise that I would be able to get home more frequently, yeah, yeah, yeah. and then. That started to add to my frustration, you know. Mm. And then, um, yeah, I just I had a couple of blowouts, and I was just like, like I'm done, because mm. I didn't, I didn't stay for the remainder of the um, second season. Yeah, I, I think I finished up like two months short or whatever. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, um, yeah, basically, pulled pin, said to you, so we know I can't do this anymore. Mm. I'm out because I need to, I need to go home. Yeah, and that was that was hard too because I think. Um, like that, it, it was it was hard, but it was like for me it was necessary. Mm. I was struggling, like I was really struggling, like mentally, you know. And then I was, you know, obviously just uh, drinking a lot in the background and not, you know, just in my in my shoebox of a apartment. Yeah, yeah. Um, and yeah, I just wasn't in a good place. So I, I needed to kind of break out, and I, th- I think that that part of it, when I look back, was was shit for Earl, because you know that wasn't 
that wasn't me uh, really kind of supporting him in his cause. Mm. But um, interestingly enough, like him and I spoke about it like a year later or whatever, and he he, he understood that I was in a hole yeah. and I needed to go. Um, and so, you know, we've had, we had a good conversation post that and I just explained to him, like, oh, yeah, I'm sorry that I didn't, wasn't able to kind of nail it for you. Mm. Um, but then coming back f- from uh, Japan gave me a good chance to kind of reflect on a lot of stuff and what I wanted, mm. how I wanted to do it, who was I as a coach, you know, what kind of coach did I want to be. Yeah. Yeah, I took a lot of, um, I took a really good look at myself and then um, got offered, I went in as an assistant as, at Waikato, started just as an RDO, yeah. just working in the community yeah. and stuff like that, and um, and then ended up going in and doing the line-outs, and, yeah. and the year after did like defeats and stuff, and then and then got offered the head coaching role. Head coaching them to titles. Oh, hey. yeah, but... <laughs> It was during that period that I was actually kind of stripping back who am I as a coach, yeah. what I want to be. That's cool. Um, what kind of person do I want to be? Mm. What do I want the players to see? What do I want them to feel when when when, when I'm with them, you know? Um, how, how do I want them to feel when they walk through the door? You know, how should they feel when they come into the room? Um, and so that uh, the, from that Coke experience... Coca-Cola experience mm. through to me taking the 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 head head coach role here at Waikato was there was a lot of kind of like right there's heaps of shit that needs to get sorted about myself mm. around my end you know at my end um, so I quit drinking quit drinking for three years yeah three years teetotal um, but it wasn't just around the coaching it was for my family as well, you know, it was I kind of got to a point where I wasn't I wasn't drinking to go and party. I was drinking to kind of fucking hide from some of my shit. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Smoking as well. Quit smoking. Yeah. Shit, no. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Love a dart. <laughs> um, but the, you know, the drinking was starting to have a negative impact. Yeah. Um, and, and I was just like, look, right, I've got to be a better dad, I've got to be a better husband. Mm. Uh, ultimately, that will also feed into me being a better coach. You know, so I, I, I um, yeah, went teetotal for just, just under three years. Was that hard? The first six months was really hard. Yeah. Because everyone knew me as, you know, um, Flossie, Flossie will come and have a beer. Yeah, it, yeah, you know? yeah, yeah. Whereas now it's great, you know, like, I can have a couple of social drinks now. Um, sweet, mm. have a couple, put it down, go home. Don't, it, like it's secondary to my interaction with the person I'm with. Yeah, yeah. So whereas it used to be the primary reason I was in the room. Yeah, you know. Um, so it's, yeah, I took that time to actually rewire myself and recalibrate my thinking and my relationship with alcohol. Yeah, and now. Now it's it's awesome, you know. I can sit down, and just have a wine with my wife, you know. Just the one doesn't mean that I have to be out the back <laughs> sneaking a couple extra bottles, you know. Do you know what I mean? Like, yeah, yeah. yeah. But I, I just through through my whole career, that's that's what um, was the norm, you mm. know. And and for a lot of the guys that were with, you know, that I kind of went along the journey with, it was work hard, play hard, mm. and. Um, I yeah, didn't realise I'd actually got myself into a bit of a pickle with, with how I was kind of um, using it. Mm. Yeah. And it wasn't until I got slapped in the face a few times and, you know, but a couple of big ones to really kind of peel back the blinkers and go, shit, you got a real problem here, you know? Yeah. Uh, e- everything about this relationship with the substance is, is, um, is hurting. Yeah. A lot of the areas in your life that should be really healthy and, and happy, you know. Yeah. And so, I just, I just took the step to, to just cut it, and um, as a result, now you know my relationship with my wife, my kids, uh, my players, is like a 
love it. Mm. My coaches, you know, that I work with, it's it's been it's been the best thing. Single, like if there was one thing that you said, what's been the most life changing thing, like outside of having kids and getting married? <laughs> um, yeah, was was making the decision to go right. Fucking alcohol's alcohol's no good for you, mm. you know, and. And um, you know, I've got my place to. My, I've got my, like I said, I've got myself to a place now where I can, I can actually, uh, you know, enjoy a couple of drinks, be social, um, but knowing full well that it's it's secondary, mm-hmm. it's not primary, and it's it's just part of the engagement. It's not. The engagement, yeah, 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 and that was that was where I'd kind of gone a little bit wrong, and yeah, you know, it, it took a lot of hard work, yeah. But I even said to the team, I told the team, my first day as a head coach, I was like, right, part of, part of this for me as a coach is I'm going to be completely transparent with you guys. So what does that mean? It's like I'm an alcoholic, and I was like, and I've decided to quit drinking because I was like. I decided before I took this job, you um, you deserve the best of me all of the time, mm. not some of the time. So I've made the decision to stop drinking, and um, yeah. Um, what I noticed from those players wasn't um, there was no mocking, there was no like gags, mm. there was just a groundswell of support from them. And it was funny too because I was like, I'd have like a zero uh, percent beer. Yeah. And they'd come up and they'd be like, oh, just checking. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but, that's cool. Yeah, and that's what I've noticed. The difference about the players now versus the players back then mm-hmm. is if you'd said that back then, everyone, someone would be sitting there going, challenge accepted. <laughs> and there'd be a Cordy that week. You'd be stood up and you'd be, you know, yeah, yeah. you'd be getting jugs rammed into you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and, Whereas now these guys have got way more um, empathy and, and and willingness to understand that people struggle through stuff. Yeah, yeah, that's where I see like um, there's a high EQ. Yeah, they've got all a lot of them have got a high EQ, you know, and they like actually sit there and consider other people's um, struggle mm. a lot more than what we used to do. We used to just. You know, our way of dealing with it was just mocking each other. Yeah, yeah, you, you know? take the piss. You take the piss yeah. until it's just like, but, you know, I only take the piss because I love you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Now they're actually more considered and um, a little bit more strategic around mm. how they, you know, navigate those spaces. Mm. Um, and, yeah, yeah, I was like, it was awesome. Right, it's powerful. It's a powerful share. Yeah, it was, it's just, I guess it's just, it's life, really, yeah, you know. Yeah. I'm not the only one. <laughs> Definitely won't be the last, yeah. you know, player to go through some kind of struggle mm. or, or battle with with alcohol or substance or whatever. Mm-hmm. Um, but, you know, I'm in a real good place now and I, I don't have any... Um, I'm just, yeah, I just really feel good, mm. you know. Like, you know, fuck. My wide oil feels fucking solid. Yeah. You know? We'll race through these um, last questions. This has been... <laughs> like, has Dan Cron turned up? One of the hell... You better not have. <laughs> one of the best yarns in the history, but we have got a heap of questions come through. Um, ask him about the time he hit Pet Cowan off his bike when he was oh. a kid in his car. <laughs> 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 Who said that through? Uh, Waxy, maybe? Was Waxy. That? Yeah. <laughs> okay, so... We lived on the same road. Yeah. So, you know, I said, grew up on the same house. I'm sorry, small flat, moved across the road, lived in that house. And <laughs> next to, like, the school fence is quite high. Yeah. And so as you're driving out of the driveway, you, know, you can't see anything. And um, I don't know where I was going, but I was leaving, leaving my parents' place. I pulled out of my car and had the Sabari Legacy. He had a blow off album, it was like, Yeah, already. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> 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 but I was a real gangster, eh? He was like, yeah, family. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, yeah, I was 
cruising around like bloody Dominic Toretto yeah. back in the days. And um, just poke the nose out just beyond the fence so I could see before you pull out onto the road. Yeah. Just as I put the, the nose of the car out, this kid is just going for it on his bike. And whack. Straight into the side, over the bonnet, oh. like scorpions on the bonnet, like legs over the top, rolls off the other side. And I'm like, oh, fuck. You know, like. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because he was riding on the footpath because it's the main road. Mm. And um, I jump out and I was like, fuck. Oh, no. I was like, oh, it's the kid from down the road. Um, helped him up and his bike was. Bike was racing. Like he was going. Full, he was full send yeah, on yeah. the footpath, just hustling it out, going to school. He's like, yeah, yeah. <laughs> those and boom, and um, and <laughs> turns out it was Pete Cowan. <laughs> he lived so down the road. <laughs> he lived down the road, and his dad, Maurice. Yeah, yeah. He was um, he was like a petoni stalwart. Yeah, and um, you know, he passed away sadly um, a number of years ago. But he was a Petoni store, right? Yeah. And I was playing at Petoni at the time. Oh, true. Yeah. And so, because Pick's a few years younger than me. And <laughs> I go and see Morris Morris because I was like, oh, who's going to fix my car, you know, insurance and stuff like that. <laughs> I was like, I go and see his old man at Petoni. I was like, hey, Morris, uh, what are we going to do about fixing my car? And he's like, I'm not going to do fucking anything. <laughs> You're going to fix it yourself. No, fuck off. And I was like, okay. Because <laughs> he was like old school. He was, you know, he's quite old school. Yeah, yeah, like, yeah. I'm not going to fucking do anything. You're gonna fix it yourself. Now fuck off. <laughs> and I was like, yeah, okay. <laughs> oh, that is a good one. Okay, best guess. How many McFlurries has he had in his lifetime? Oh, no idea. <laughs> That's come from Steph. Yeah, it has. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Big McFlurry man. Or well, used to do McFlurry runs all the time. Oh, did yeah. You know, Steph was my um, uh, MC at my wedding. Oh, was he? Yeah. Oh, true. He was awesome. Yeah. I reckon you'd do a good job of that today. <laughs> well, hopefully you're not getting married again. But... Oh, no, 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 no. <laughs> <laughs> but don't know how many McFlurries. Oh, I'm just saying you could do, like, you could be like the, you know, going to a, uh, what do you call it, become a wedding celebrant. <laughs> <laughs> what a lad, wedding celebrant. <laughs> yeah, 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 100%. Like... That's the future. Okay, well, anyway, next question. What was his true odometer on his gangster Toyota Hilux? Wineback Clock King. Who was that? Fuffer. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you used to have a, a – a, 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 I had this Hilux. And you could like, – like a thing that you pulled. Yeah. Turn the odometer off so you didn't have to pay your <laughs> road users for <fate>. ages. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, what was his thinking behind his workout DHS dumb hard shit <laughs> pick a dumb number of reps make sure that um, the exercise is hard as fuck yeah and you feel like shit afterwards <laughs> then you've usually is that done. how you lost your 18 kgs or whatever it was yeah <laughs> then you use, it usually ends up working out well for you yeah yeah <laughs> I like that. Okay, any ripper Jamie Joe stories? Getting push, pushed up a hill. Jamie Joe's he's special, bro. Yeah. I mean, you've had a few bangers on here, right? Oh, mate. Everyone loves a Jamie Joe yeah. story on here. I only get him on, really. I've got a couple. I've got one. I okay. remember. So this goes back to um, uh, the 2008 year when I made the end of year tour. Yeah. And there was had to go back and play NPC. Jamie was the. The NPC coach. Yeah. And um, at that time, that was when um, in the preseason, me and Mussy, Chris Mussoy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We'd, we'd had a couple of drinks. <laughs> and we're down in Blenheim. <laughs> Jamie wasn't happy with the sea. Yeah. And um, the next day we had training. He's like, bro, you boys, I want to talk to you. Let's go over here. He walks us over to the other side of the, the field and he sits us down on this bench. And he's like, right. Used to drinking, can't have it. Can't drink with the boys. Not allowed. Yeah. I'm like, hey. He's like, nah, nah. You're not good for this team. It's not good. He's like, you, because the mussy, you beat them all up. <laughs> He's like, then you, you fucking take all of them with you. <laughs> he goes, so you still can't drink with the team. He goes, I don't give a fuck what you do. 
but you're not doing it. You're not doing it with the rest of the group. Yeah, you just go do it together. Shit. I'm like, wow. You just said he beats everyone up. So <laughs> <laughs> it's only the two of us. <laughs> it's not. <laughs> but anyway, we go through the season. Don't we, we kind of stay? We we keep. We don't. You know. Yeah. We listen to what he says. I'm getting close to getting to the All Blacks, and um, <laughs> play the final. And and me and Jamie have got like this. Like we get along great. Mm. Off, off, off the field, but as a coach-player relationship, we would clash. Yeah, you know, we were just like I'd arc up, like he'd be doing something like horrific. We'd be doing like a hundred down and ups plus pick and goes down the five meter channel, just yeah, getting yeah, smoked, yeah. and yeah. it was just like you know, I'd just stand there and just be like, what are we doing? Yeah, you know? and just him and I would get into verbals on the field. We just you know, <laughs> full on arguments, <laughs> and um, but. Outside of rugby, get along like a house on fire. Yeah. You know, just we would clash yeah. in the grass. And anyway, we got, we get to the end of the year. It's after the final. We just lost to Canterbury, I think, 6-7. And um, they named the All Blacks end of year tour in the changing room afterwards. Yeah. And I get named. And so we have to assemble the next day in Auckland, I think. And anyway, we had like our team you know, the, the end of year thing, and we, it was at a pub in town, and I still remember, like, Jamie was like, I went in only for a couple of beers, because I was like, oh, I've got to go and go and pick. Yeah. I'm standing there, and Jamie's like, just staring at me, he's like, but, and we're around all the fish heads, he's like, wouldn't have made my all black team. <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, <laughs> <laughs> and I, by this time, I was like, "Fuck it!" I'm I'm because I just signed with Canterbury, so I was leaving Wellington. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I was like, oh, "Fuck it, send it." And I chopped my beer, put it down. I was like, "Well, you're not the coach, so you can get fucked." <laughs> <laughs> and then, and then I just walked out, and I was like, "Oh, by the way, I signed with Canterbury," and walked out the door. <laughs> and he's like, "Stand here." He's like, and then I didn't see him again for like four years, right? Because after that, I didn't end up playing for Canterbury. Yeah. I did the next Super, then I went to France. Yeah. And and I don't see him for like. Well, until I come back to New Zealand the next time, when I come back, like you know, I was explaining yeah, yeah, yeah. that the Bayon thing, then to Wasps, then Rung Boydy, come back to Wellington, yeah. And I play um, play NPC, go all right. Then I get the Chiefs thing, but the Maldives had an end of year tour. Oh, true. And I get named in the Maldi All Blacks, and oh. I was like, oh, this is weird. You know, like yeah, I'm yeah. sitting there going, hmm, this is weird because <laughs> Jamie's the coach, and I'm like, the last time I saw him, I told him to. Yeah, you know, like I was yeah. like, oh. and, and we meet at Spencer on Byron, and um, the team assembles at Spencer on Byron, and we get there, and the boys coming in, dribs and drabs, and they're all up in the first floor where the bar is, and I'm just sitting there waiting. Then all of a sudden, I hear this Flossy! <laughs> Turn around, and I was like, "Hey, Jake, he's like, hey, good to see you, mate. Good to see you. How are you? You good? Good? Good?" Grabs my hand, pulls me in. He goes. <laughs> Got some unfinished business, and then I was like, this. <laughs> and I was like, four years. That's the first thing he said to me when I got there. I got some unfinished business. Whispered it in my ear, and I was like, oh no, I am in trouble. Like I was contemplating, like just pulling the ripcord and going, I can't go on this I'm tour. Out. I am out. He is just going to punish the shit out of me every single training. Eh? But, oh well, that's good. But my eyes just went like saucers. Eh? He's like, hey, oh yeah, I can see it. Unfinished business. Oh, one of the great yarns. Oh. Okay, last one. Best piece of advice for a Waterlead listener. Just do you. Yeah. Be your authentic self. That's what I reckon. I love it. Mm. And it's you. Yeah. And it's true. And hopefully everyone's heard that through this oh, couple of hours. One of the best. Sorry. Nah. Rambler. So good. Absolute rambler. Mate, so many lessons, so much value in that couple of hours and what a story what a, what a journey yeah some tough <laughs> lessons but hopefully the p- listeners can um, learn from them so hopefully people they don't have to, that I'm not that smart they don't have to go through the experience like you have so um, but mate you're, you're a legend of the game it's been awesome having you on and appreciate you giving up your time and coming on the Waterlead podcast oh bro honestly I'm so grateful and like it's so cool to see you like A not only transition from coaching and uh, playing into coaching but then 
the side hustle that's now becoming probably your main hustle. So <laughs> be up there with Joe Rogan. Shortly, bro. <laughs> well, more guests like you, and um, we'll fast track it. So yeah. appreciate you coming on, man. Nah, thanks, bro. Appreciate it, lad. <laughs>